the Church of Jesus Christ. We're happy to be here, and we are happy to be studying this lesson this morning. Amen. Everybody doing all right? Amen. Good day to be alive, right? Every day in, the, every day in this world is a good day. It's good to be in the land of the living. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Our lesson today is uh, the sun greater than angels. And so we're, gonna, we're in the book of Hebrews. We're in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is not necessarily most, you know, the easiest book to understand. Because one of the prerequisite um, for prerequisite reading for Hebrews is Leviticus. Um, if you don't know what is in Leviticus, you're going to have a difficult time trying to understand the book of Hebrews. The same way with the book of Revelation. If you try to read Revelation without first reading Daniel, you're going to be in some trouble because you're going to wonder what are these symbols and signs. But if you're familiar with the language in Daniel, reading Revelation becomes so much easier. You can understand it so much better. The same is true about Hebrews. If you're familiar with Leviticus, the Leviticus systems and the priesthood and the sacrifices and Melchizedek and all these things, then when you come to the book of Hebrew now, then you have a better understanding of what the author is talking about. All right? So uh, Hebrew is heavy laden with a lot of theology. It's, it's again, it's not... The easiest book to understand but we're going to give it our best shot at least the first chapter so our text comes to us from hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 9 only nine verses but these nine verses are power packed <laughs> there's so much meat uh in these nine verses that it's really this book is not designed for for babes really it's really for mature christians who can understand um the context here about AD 60, most people believe that the book was written in early AD 60s, so about 30 or so years after Jesus departed the scene, and it was one of the earliest books to be written. Place unknown, and our golden text says, God who at sundry times, or sundry times, and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his, his son. And the operative word here is son. Our aim today is to set forth Jesus Christ as God's ultimate revelation of himself. Um, Jesus Christ is not the only revelation of God, but he's the ultimate revelation. Everything that came before him is pale in comparison to the revelation of God that we have in Jesus Christ. It doesn't get better than Jesus. Amen. It doesn't get better. It's the culmination. It's the, you know, apart from seeing God in his unadulterated form, which we can see because he dwelled in light, unapproachable light. A light, scripture says that no man can approach. So you can see him in his unadulterated form but you can see Jesus, which is the what God manifested in the flesh. Everything, the very fiber that makes up God is the same fiber that makes up Jesus. It's no different. The same material that makes up God is the same material that makes up Jesus because Jesus is God. Our principle is to establish the divinity, identity, or divine, sorry, identity of Jesus Christ. And so we know Jesus is both man and God. And this is something that <clears throat> the Jews struggled with because they didn't see the Messiah as having any divine nature at all. They just see, the, the, see him as just having a human nature. So when, they con when they're confronted with Jesus now, who has both a human nature and a divine nature, they don't know what to do with the divine nature. So they accuse him of blaspheming. Because how can you blaspheme against yourself? He's God, so how can he blaspheme against himself? But they did not understand, they did not perceive, they did not uh, grasp that the Messiah was going to have a human nature and a divine nature. They struggled with the divine nature. Right? That's why the scripture says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the what? The sons of God. And that is who we are. Amen? Application is to give students a deeper and a richer appreciation for who Jesus really is. Amen? All right. So we're going to read, read a passage here. Um, Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4. You can follow along in your, in your Bibles. I hope you have your Bibles out and ready. And it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed here of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of his word, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. For unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. A lot of verses to unpack. A lot of meat in these nine verses that could take us a whole month just to unpack this thing. So, But we have the task of trying to unpack it in uh, 40 minutes. Yes. All right, let's, let's go. So let's talk about the authorship of the book of Hebrews. And um, up to today, most of us accept it as you know, the, the Apostle Paul. But scholars debate is a, is a matter of debate. Uh, and the real authorship, as far as they are concerned, is unknown. Uh, the Apostle Paul is one potential author. And many of us, at least in this part of the world, credit Paul as the author, right? But when scholars start to dig deeper and look at the language and look at some of the things, they realize that there's some, there's some uh, in evidence that it might not be Paul. However, Clement of Alexandria supports the Paul in authorship when he wrote, and I quote, that the letter is Paul's, referring to Hebrew, and that it was written to Hebrews in the Hebrew language and translated into Greek by Luke. So he thinks that Paul wrote it, but it was translated into Greek by, his, by Luke, right? Eusebius also supports Paul in authorship, and he wrote, I quote, the thoughts are those of the emissary, meaning the apostle, but the language and composition are that of one who recalled from memory, as it were, made notes of what was said by his master. So he's, he's also alluding to the fact that the, uh, the true author may have dictated it to somebody else who wrote it. Because when they compare the language of Hebrews with the language of the other um, letters that Paul definitely wrote, they find that the language is, com is very different. The language in Hebrew is smoother, more, it's easier to digest. It's a, it's a more, it's a higher literary form than the other letters that we find that Paul wrote. So debate about who's the author. Um, one argument against Paul in authorship states that the book was thought to have been written in the late first century, um, who, who, uh, two decades after the death of the apostle. So here's debate. Um, the, the main important thing is that the true author is God, right? That, that's the main point. This is the word of God. And it is important, right? Other potential authors are Apollos, Priscilla, Clement, and Luke. These are all other potential authors of the book. So the authorship 
But we accept in a general sense that Paul wrote it. Most preachers, when they refer, they refer to, you know, as a, as a letter that Paul wrote to the Hebrews. So why study? Why study Hebrews in the first place? Why do we even study this book? Because um, it was certainly written, it's a letter written to Christians who are within the framework of the law or the Torah. It's a book that refers and quotes Leviticus probably a hundred times. So why should we as Gentiles study? As the title suggests, Pros Hebreos, which is the Greek, it's written to, to Hebrews. To, Hebrews is a name that is an ancient name for the Jewish people, right? So we don't call them Hebrews today, we call them Jews for the most part, but it suggests that the book concerns itself with topics of interest to believers in Jesus who are Jewish. Topics such as priesthood. Well, we, we, we don't know too much about the priesthood other than what we read in Leviticus, right? We weren't within that framework. Gentiles were. Sacrificial systems, angels, Melchizedek, Abraham, Moses, the Israelites in the wilderness, the biblical covenants, the Old Testament men of faith and women of faith, the role of the law in the new covenant, and so on and so forth and so on. These are all topics that are very prevalent in the book of Hebrews. So why should we read Hebrews? Because it is scripture. What does the scripture, what does the Bible say? All scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God and is profitable for four things. One, for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work. So we study it because it makes us more equipped, right? And it enhances our understanding of God's will and God's plan. Not for the lives of the Jews only, but for our individual lives. Amen? So it's important to study Hebrews. Moreover, the main point, and the Greek is kephalalion, the main point, the kephalalion of the book of Hebrews is this, is to show that Jesus and everything connected with him are better than what was available previously. That's the main point of the book, is that Jesus and everything that's connected with him, we're talking about the priesthood, his priesthood, because he's a priest after the order of who? Melchizedek or Melchizedek, right? right. Not uh, after the Aaronic priesthood. Sacrificial system. He offered a better sacrifice, right? Because he himself offered himself as a sacrifice. So he's a told once and for all. Every year the priest would have to offer goats of bullocks and turtle doves every year. It was a temporary system. And it addressed sins on a temporary basis. But what Jesus' sacrifice did was to atone for sin once and for all. So there's no need to, for him to go die every year. He died once and atoned for our sins forever. And his atonement was a real atonement. Not the atonement of turtle doves and blood of goats and bullocks and the splinking of the red heifer and all this that kind of stuff. That was a temporary system. And um, so for Jesus says, everything connected with Jesus are better than what was available previously, right? So that's the main thrust of the book of Hebrew. He uses the word better 12 times to compare Jesus Christ and his era with, than, with that which was before. It appears first in verse 4 and last in verse 12, in chapter 12, verse 24. So a whole, whole what? Um, 12 chapters comparing Jesus and what is associated with him to what was available before. And the conclusion is Jesus is better in every aspect, in every area, better promises, better sacrifice. You know, we are built upon better, better promises, etc., etc. better priesthood. Um, you know, his promises are greater and better. And um, so forth and so on. So the author makes this comparison. All right. So let us get into the, 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 the verses here that we have before us because that's the, the most we can do because time is going to run out real quick. So one thing that differentiates God from idols is that he is a God that what? 
speaks. In the ancient time, right, in ancient world, in antiquity, in, in, in biblical times, what people used to do, they used to go to the, 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 the forest and they would chop down trees and they would make these idols. I mean, real, real idols, some were pocket sized, some were, you know, large, and they would bow down to them and they would worship them. But those things have eyes, but they couldn't see, ears, but they couldn't hear. Moat, but they couldn't speak. So the author wants us to be clear that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a God that what? Speaks. He spoke in time past and he's speaking right now. And if you if you are sensitive enough and you listen, you will hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. God is a God that speaks. God is not static. He's constantly talking. If you listen, he's constantly directing your path via the Holy Ghost. If you have the Holy Ghost, the Ho God will talk to you. And he'll speak to you. I mean, for me, he speaks through my conscience. Whenever he wants me to do something, I feel a physical burning feeling in my heart. And I know this is what God is saying. And you have to figure out, you have to learn the voice of God to know when God is talking to you. Because I guarantee you, in the smallest thing, something that you think God is not interested in, um, God is still is talking. In, is God is talking, always talking, always speaking. I'm not sure what happened here, but um, God is constantly speaking. There we go. Um, God is constantly speaking, and he speaks over and over again unto his people. All right? So in days gone by, when the Old Testament was written, God was speaking, was being written, God spoke. Thus said the Lord. You know, when you read the prophets, you hear a lot of thus said the Lord, right? When you read the Old Testament, because God is constantly talking to his people. Some people claim to believe in God, but not that he spoke. Some people think that God is just out there somewhere, unconnected from the world, doesn't care about what's going on. But God is so connected to the world that God speaks to you and me every single day about every decision that we make. If we just take the time to listen, you will hear what the Lord is saying. Because the steps of a good man are what? Ordered by the Lord. And how can he order your steps if you can't hear the direction that you should go, right? So God is, you have to, you have, to have a hear to hear what the Spirit is saying. If God did not speak, let's just say, if God did not speak, if he had not revealed anything specific to us, if there are none of his words that can, that, which can guide a person towards true knowledge about God, humanity and the relationship between them, then God is unconnected with this life and is irrelevant. So if, a, if we serve a God that don't speak, what's the point, right? Would you serve a God that don't talk to you and don't give a direction and tell you what's right and tell you what's wrong? No, but that's not the God that we speak. We speak. A, we, we serve a God that speaks, and He speaks clearly and loudly. I remember one time I was um, to tell you how God speaks. Give you an example. I was going to pursue a PhD in in a, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and um, I was at, all the way in Chicago. I went to this conference, and I'm like, "Yes, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to." quit my job and five years and study and whatever, become a professor. And uh, I said, but you know, I never even talked to God Bishop about it. I never said that thing to God. So I went to my room, kneeled down on my bed. And before I open, <laughs> before I could open my mouth and say, Lord, is this your will? A big voice came through the room. This is not what I have for you. I'm like, what? I broke down in tears. You hear me? I cried like a baby. Because I came all the way from Maryland to Chicago, five days in a conference, spend money. Sp and the Lord said, this is not what I have for you. And that was it. No other sound. I'm like, oh my God, really? I was so broken. I had to call my wife crying. Oh, yeah, the Lord said. So I came back um, and went a different direction. But to, to confirm what he said, I went to the ATM, right? And, and I took $20 out of my account. And 20 dollars came out, but guess what? Another 20 dollars just float down after the 20. So 40 dollars. I checked my account, only 20 dollars came out. And the same voice that said, This is not what I have to you, said, This is how I'm going to provide for you. 
So even though I was disappointed, I was also consoled because he was saying, I, I'm going to do it in a way that you can't even imagine. You're depending on your own ability and your own skill to take care of yourself. But I have a different way and a different pathway for you. So I had to suck it up and, um, you know, serve God as he would have me to do. So needless to say, I didn't um, pursue that. All right. And I went another way. So God constantly speaks. And you can have, you can, you should have testimonies of how God speaks to you. God spoke directly in many ways, in various ways, directly and indirectly, in dreams and stories, in history and prophecy, poems, and in Proverbs to the fathers of the Jewish people, through the prophets from Moses to Malachi, and before Moses to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? If you notice the Old Testament, the, how many books in the Old Testament? Let me quiz you real quick. How many books? 39. How many of them are prophetic books? How many books are prophetic books? Uh, so, all right. Um, I'll just say 17 of the 39 are prophetic books. So therefore, the main source of God's communication was through what? The prophecies, right? So of 39, uh, you have five that are what we'll called the, the law. Then you have some that are history, some that are poems and writings. And majority of the Old Testament is prophecy. 17 of them are prophetic books. So the main way God spoke to the, to the fathers was through the what? To the prophets. God who had sundry times, diverse manners, right? Dreams and visions and story and history spake in time past unto the fathers by the, the prophets. The major method of communication was by the prophet. God's main source of communication in days gone by was by the prophets. All right, um, Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets for the next 400 years. We call that the silent years, 400 centuries, four centuries is 400 years. <clears throat> God didn't say a word, not a mumbling word. So to so use the remark of an earlier prophet, the word of Adonai was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision, 1 Samuel 3, verse 12. So 400 years, the word of the Lord was rare. But in the last days, the Old Testament call it the latter days, but the New Testament call it the last days, which the New Testament regards as already been here. Because when you read this in time past, you know, but in verse two, have in these last days. So when this, when the writer was writing this, they considered it the last days, and that has been more than two thousand years now. So you see, the last days we are now in the end of the end of the last days right now. We're we're closer than you think, right? And so, um, so God has spoken again, and uh, he has spoken again, not to the fathers long dead, but to us in the first century, through his son. So who is he speaking through now? His son. He spoke through the prophets mainly, and now he's speaking mainly through his what? His son. And by implication that his son is what? Is greater than the, the prophets. So... We, deal, we dealt with verses 1 and verse 2. We have a good understanding of that. God spoke in time past. Now he's still speaking, but he's speaking through his son. And now there are seven features of his son that demonstrate that his son is superior, especially over angels, since this is our topic, right? The first one is that God has given him ownership of everything. Everything. God is the, it says, whom he hath appointed here of all things. The literal interpretation of that is God has given him ownership of everything. So who owns everything? Jesus owns everything. God, God has given him ownership of everything. He says what? Literally, God has made him here of all things. Ask of me and I will give you nations as an inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. That's Psalms 2. So in that, that interpretation means that God, Jesus now owns everything, right? And the good thing about it is you and I are what? Joined here. That means if he, if he owns everything, then what do you own? You own everything too. So don't walk around here like you're poor. You own the ends of the earth. If you're in God, if you're of God, if you're in Christ, 
whatever Christ own, you own. Because you're a joint heir with Christ Jesus. A joint inheritor, in other words. You know, you have a will and you make one person an inheritor and another person a joint inheritor. It's a legal term. It means whoever is named as inheritor is the owner of the estate or the property that's been left on the will, right? So God wrote his will. And he, he named Jesus the inheritor. And you and I are joint heirs with him. So we are also named as inheritor of the ends of the earth. So we own everything. So let you know, let these people who think they own something, let them go ahead, right? Because we know we own everything, right? We possess everything. All right. Um, so that's the first characteristic of the Son of God that makes him superior to angels. He owns everything. Angels own nothing, right? They own nothing. They own nothing. But we and Jesus, we own everything. If we own everything, what is left for angels to own? Nothing. <laughs> what is there for anybody else to own? Nothing. Because we own everything. Right? God has given him ownership of everything. Right? So we, 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 we a cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the what? The fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. A cattle upon a thousand hills belong to him. So you're not poor. You are rich. Because you are joined here with Christ. All right? The next thing is that God created the universe through him. As taught in St. John chapter 1 verse 3. Right? And Colossians 1 16. You don't have time to read it. Read that in your spare time. That the universe was created through an intermediary. Which is called the what? The word. Because God spoke words. And what are words? What are thoughts anyway? Thoughts are just unspoken words, right? But when God have a thought, this called the Logos, which is in St. John, that God have a thought, and then God speak the thought, the thought become words, and the words was the agent that God used to create everything that you see. Living things, invisible and invisible, thrones and dominions, everything in the universe. And trust me, the universe is vast. I said the universe is vast. Many galaxies we can't in our lifetime, and that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to when I get to heaven, is to is to skip from one you know, one from one galaxy to the other, uh, and to I, I'll vacation on Mars and then I'm on Jupiter the next. I'm looking forward to that ability to be able to experience all of the universe of God, not just what we have here on Earth, because we know that what we have here on Earth is not. The entire universe, right? So he created all things, um, <clears throat> appointed him of all things, by whom also he made the words. So who made the world? The, the word of God, right? Which became, was made flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, and that is Jesus. So Jesus is the incarnate word, right? And um, he, the spoken word was which what was used to create the universe. So if God think think about a thing and the thing come to, and when he speaks it, 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 it creates. So God's words have creative power. And you know that your words have creative power too? When you, when you speak things, you know, some people, oh God, I'm poor, I'm weak, I'm sick, I'm tired. Check them, they're going to be weak, sick, tired, I'm poor. But if you start to speak words over your life, I'm blessed of God and highly favored. I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and not beneath. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you begin to speak those things over your life, your words begin to create that in your life. Because we, we, we have the nature of God, believe it or not. We have the nature of God because the words that you speak have creative power. They can create good things or bad things. So why not speak good things over your life? Because the words are creating your future. Confess the word of God over your life. And when you do that, you create what the word says about you. But when you confess what the devil says, and what the doctor says, and what the friends say, and what your family say about you, you become exactly what they say. But when you confess what God says about you, then that's the future you create for yourself. 
So your words have creative power. And you should utilize it. You should utilize it, right? There's a scripture that talks about life and death is in the power of the tongue. So something of that nature. You can, um, but it's just just it, it's just emphasizing the point that the words, just like when God speaks, his thoughts, unspoken words, his words create. We have the same ability to speak things over our lives and to create the future that we want. So stop confessing what you don't want. Just stop talking about what you don't have and begin to speak what you want. Speak about the future that you want, you see yourself walking in and, the, and your children in and your church in. I see every bench in this church occupied. I see every row full because that's the future I want for this church. I'm going to speak that into existence. So God created the universe through him. The third thing that makes him superior is that this sun is the radiance or literally the glory, the brightness of his glory. Best rendered Shekinah. The Hebrew word is Shekinah. And um, it means, it's defined as the divine presence, the numinous imminence of God in the world. What does that mean? A revelation of the holy in the midst of the profane. In other words, God is so holy. Where God dwells, he dwells in such light, immortality and light that no man can approach it. So in order for God to interact with man, he comes up with the, he manifests himself as Shekinah. A light that you can, we can interact with. It's the presence of the holy God in the midst of unholy people, in other words. And it is said that when Moses saw, what Moses saw was not God in all of his glory, but was the Shekinah of God. Is the Shekinah, the back part of God, the Shekinah. Not because you know, no man can look God in his face. Because as I said, where God dwells, you can't even approach it, much less to, much less to look in God's face, right? The, the best interaction of God we're going to ever get is Jesus Christ. And the apostles had the privilege. They, 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 they handled him with their hands. They leaned on his breast. They interacted with God because he, but, but, but Jesus was not just human being. He was the Shekinah of God. He was the brightness of his glory. The brightness of his glory. The very God himself in a form that you and I can take. Just like the Holy Ghost. God give us the Holy Ghost. It is God. It's all God. But it's just enough of God that we can handle. Because if God should pour all of himself in you, you couldn't handle it. I mean, sometimes the Holy Ghost um, have you have me a certain way, and and I'm like, man, if, if can you imagine all of God, it's, it's impossible, right? The whole universe can't even hold God. The whole universe can't contain Him. He, you can't put Him in a bottle and say this is God, because that bottle will burst into a hundred pieces, because God is so potent. So Jesus is the radiance of his glory or the brightness of God's glory and it's the Shekinah of God, right? And he's also the what? The express image of his person and the Greek word character is, is brought up here. The very expression of God. Used only here in the New Testament, it, it underscores clearly that Jesus was the very reflection, image, picture if you take a picture of God, what you would see develop would be Jesus. If you took a picture of God, if you could, just say you could, you got near enough, right? And you had some telescope that was so far away that you could snap a picture. What, what, would, you, what would you see would be Jesus Christ. Because he's the very character of, you can't separate Jesus from God. You can't separate Jesus from God. He is all God. You understand? He can't, so he's the character of God. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Scripture says what? Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 
he was seen of angels, believed on in the world, right? Preach unto the Gentiles, believe on in the world, and receive up into glory. So the scripture makes it clear that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And if you really understand it, God is Christ. Not just in Christ, God is Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The express image of God. And uphold all things by the what? The, the word of his power or his powerful word. Think about it, beloved. The universe that we live in, the world, that the earth that we live in now, is hung up, is hung in space. What's holding up the earth in space? But in other words, at the sun, what's holding up the sun? Do you see any sticks holding up the sun? You see anything holding up the sun in the universe? God created it and hung it up in space. The earth is 93 million miles away from the sun, right? And it revolves around the sun and its axis. If the earth got a little bit closer, what would happen to all of us? We'd all burn and die. If it got further, we'd all what? Freeze to death. But, but the earth has not moved from where God put it when it was created 5,750 years ago. It's still there. What is maintained in the universe? The same word that created it is the same powerful word that's maintaining it right now. So God's powerful word maintain the universe so the world can continue. Another thing, for example, what percentage of the earth of the earth's atmosphere of the of the atmosphere is oxygen? I think about 23%, right? I know I'm throwing out some signs at you. And some of you have been away from school so long that so I, I get it. So um about 23% of the earth's of the atmosphere, the air that we breathe is oxygen, right? Now what creates oxygen? Let me see if at least one of us remember that. What creates oxygen? What produces oxygen? Trees, the vegetation. And we 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 breathe oxygen in and we exhale carbon dioxide. The trees taking carbon dioxide create oxygen and breathe and release oxygen, right? Now we're constantly cutting down trees. So who, who is maintaining that 23% oxygen in the air if we are constantly cutting down trees and planting more trees? So you know it's not the trees because if that was the case, then the oxygen level would fluctuate, to right? So today it's 23, tomorrow is 24, the next day is 20 based on the number of trees that's producing oxygen. But so we know that it couldn't be the trees that's maintaining it. It must be God. So he maintains everything by the power of his word so that the world can continue. So, so listen, um, let me give you an example. If, if you, have you ever climbed a mountain, like a high mountain, like 7,000 feet or above? Okay, when you get up there, it's hard to breathe. Why? Because the, the oxygen level is much less. Right, so you you so whenever the oxygen level is lower, it's difficult to breathe. But so so and when it, when if the oxygen level gets too high, what's what you think will happen? You know, oxygen is 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 a flammable gas, right? If you light a match close to an oxygen, it can boom. So if it goes too high, the earth you could light a match and you you the whole earth could explode, right? So somebody is maintaining the exact amount of oxygen so that we don't blow up or we don't have shortness of breath. And that person here is telling us is that he uphold all things by the power of his word. It is God that's maintaining the universe as this whole thing would collapse long time ago. It's, it's, it's the will of God. But it's, it's all coming to a close though. Remember that. God have a purpose and God have a time. He has a purpose and a time. He has a specific time to do what he's doing. So we're, thankfully, we're within that, the context of that time. But when that time expires, it expires. All right. Let's continue. The fifth thing is that Jesus not only is the word, but he has a powerful word which holds, which holds everything together. He, he, Jesus holds everything together by his powerful word, right? All right, um, the sixth thing is that the writer turns from the messianic cosmic functions 
to his function as in relationship to humanity. Through himself, he made purification for sins. Or in other words, atonement for sins. Right? It says, uh, uphold nothing by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. The word that the, the scripture says, purge our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty. Of so he made purification in himself by himself, which as explained a little at a time through the rest of the book, no one else and nothing else can do. We need to understand that. No one else and nothing else can purify our sins. No one else and nothing else can purify our sins. You say, what about the blood of well, bullocks and goats? The scripture doesn't tell you. It's impossible for these things to purge our sins. It was a temporary system put in place until the Messiah showed up. And when the Messiah showed up, he purified or purged our sins once and for all through his sacrificial death on the cross. He's the only one in all of human history from Adam until now, that qualifies. Nobody else qualifies to do such a thing. And nothing else qualifies. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can purge us and purify us from our sin. Period. Nothing else comes close. So the writer said he, he by himself purged our sins and when he did that he did finally he what he sat down at the right hand of God know what that means if somebody sit down that means the work is what it's done it's finished so some people pray Lord you know do this run God, God is not your errand boy whatever God done is already done you just need to believe God for it some things that we pray and fast and beg God for God's already done it. The question is, are you, do you have faith to receive it? Because it's already done. Because he's, after he did all that good stuff, he sat down at the right hand of God. As quoted in Psalm 110 verse 1. Frequently in this book and elsewhere the new, in the New Testament. In the Hebrew of Psalms 110 1, because that's a quotation from Psalms 110 1. The right hand of God is not a place, but refers to the Messiah's exalted status and to his intimate involvement with God as high priest interceding for those who trust in him, right? He make it intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He's constantly uh, interceding on our behalf. All right. Uh, how many times? Four minutes. All right. We're going to try to wrap this up. So Jesus' superiority over angels continues. So it is evident since he is at the right hand of God that he has become much, what? Better. Better than angels. Even though he was made for a little while lower than the angel because he became a man, right? And, and you ask the question, why is it important for the writer to even be comparing Jesus to angels, right? Because in the, in the mind of those to whom he was writing, you had God up here. Then you had angels, and then you had righteous people. And the question was, where would the Messiah fit in this category, right? Because remember, they understood the concept of the Messiah, that there was one that was going to come to deliver them and such and such. But where, was he a man? Was he an angel? Who was he? Where would he fit? So, so the writer, because he's writing to Jews, put it straight and said he's higher than the angels. In other words, he's God. He's not... Somewhere between the angels and, and God, as, as Jehovah's witness put him, right? He's a created being somewhere, you know, between the angels and God. No, he's better than the angels, more superior to the angels. And the only, per the only thing or only uh, person superior and better to angels is God. So he puts the Messiah right in the category of God. In other words, he's saying that the Messiah is God himself with a divine nature and a divine character of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's Yahweh manifested in the flesh. He's better than he's better because the name God has given him is superior to them, right? He's being made, verse 4 said, so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. 
Philippians 2, verse 9 and 11. What does that say? What time is it? Is up? What does that say? Two minutes and 39 seconds. That's for everything. All right. Um, it's up. So let me just quote this one scripture. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow, should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Lord bless you. My time has expired. Sorry for overdoing. Give me all in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me all in my lamp, I pray. Oh, give me all in my lamp, keep me burning, keep me burning, keep me burning to the break of day. Oh, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, 